All right. Hello, everybody. This is Lance Tomashiro, and you're listening to the podcast where we talk about entrepreneurship, business, taking whatever your goals are to the next level, both in your business and personal life. You're going to love today's episode. Our guest today is Gleb Sapersky. And here's the thing, and this is why I absolutely had to have him on here, is this is something like that you don't hear every day. Gleb is a consultant, coach, speaker, and entrepreneur. I know that you've heard that before. But what's different about Gleb is he specializes in science-based strategies for wise decision-making and emotional and social intelligence to help people succeed in business and in life. Gleb, how are you doing? I'm super glad to have you here. Thanks so much for having me on, Lance. I'm really glad to be here. Okay, so let's start like right at the beginning, right where everybody is listening to this. Um, what is wise decision-making through science and, and uh, science-based decisions rather than maybe emotional-based or the way that we think we make decisions correctly? Excellent question. So science-based decision-making essentially looks at how do you make the best decisions. We all have intuitions. We all have instincts. You know, we all think that, you know, oh, uh, this diet is good for me or this diet is good for me. But when you actually go out and do the research, you find out what diet is actually good for people so that they have the most healthy outcomes. When you, the same thing goes on in business. When you look at business and people have, again, different intuitions, this is the right thing to do, or this is the right thing to do. Well, it turns out that no, your intuitions are not necessarily going to steer you in the right way. Just as if, you know, if you have an intuition when um, your boss is criticizing you, to punch your boss in the face, <laughs> that's probably not the best intuition. You know, most of us would intuitively recognize that that's not a good intuition. <laughs> so, I mean, the, I mean, I think yeah. that this this kind of brings up an, an interesting point because I think, you know, most people, um, as entrepreneurs who we're, we're mostly talking to, you know, they have this idea, they think they want to start a business, um, they go out, register a business, get business cards set up, and then find themselves in this sort of weird position where, they don't know what to do next, you know, find maybe that their boss isn't as big of an idiot as they thought he was, that he does a lot more than they, they thought he... So how does somebody, you know, either if they're thinking of starting a business or are kind of in that situation where they've done something and are like, oh my gosh, what should I do now? How do you balance that whole idea of this is what I want to do, which I kind of think of as intuition versus what should I actually do next? And how do you evaluate those two? Yeah, so great point. So first of all, just to be clear, intuition is not bad. Sometimes it is the right thing to do to punch your boss in the face. <laughs> <laughs> in rare instances. But uh, sometimes it's a, it is a good idea to jump on that bandwagon and go with your business. And sometimes it's a bad idea. You know, uh, one of the things that research shows that uh, happens to entrepreneurs is what's called survivorship bias. And let me share about what that is. So survivorship bias is a, a really interesting phenomenon that happens uh, in business and in other areas of life where we only hear the stories of people who succeed, people who survive in their business. So entrepreneurs tend to hear only the stories of people who succeeded. You know, the people who failed don't write books. Right, right. <laughs> so they don't survive, in other words. And therefore, entrepreneurs tend to be excessively optimistic about their prospects. In reality, you know, not to be a downer, just to be scientific, most new business startups fail. This is just a fact. This is what the research shows. So, you know, you might want to think that you're a special snowflake, but you also have to think about the probability. What's the science behind it? So using probabilistic thinking is the first kind of step. Estimate the probability. If you go into the restaurant business, let's say, and 90% of restaurant businesses fail, you should have an expectation that you will most likely fail. Right. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't go out and do the thing that you go out to do, but that means you should probably investigate first. Do a little bit of research. Don't be like the folks who just start up their business and then just go out and you know print out a bunch of brochures and flyers 
and say, yes, let's, you know, I hope my restaurant will make money. No, that's not the right way to do it. You want to research why did other restaurants fail? That is a fundamental, fundamental strategy in decision making. That's what I tell my clients. And then, by the way, for listeners, uh, I'm a professor at Ohio State studying research, so researching decision making. And I do some consulting on the side. So I tell my clients, the first thing you want to do is figure out how you will most likely fail. This is called the premortem. And the premortem involves listing out all the light, all the ways that you can fail, and not only doing it by yourself, talking to other folks who are experts in the business. If we go again, you know, with a software company, let's say, talking to other folks who succeeded in the, in the software business and seeing why they succeeded and seeing, talking to people who failed and seeing why they failed and learning from them, learning what not to do and what to do. So doing a pre-mortem, uh, that's uh, something that's a basic strategy that you want to do to figure out whether and how you should proceed. And I mean, I think that you're right. I mean, the, the one word that really stuck out to me as you were explaining this is excessively optimistic. I guess that's two words, but excessively optimistic. And I think that on one hand, that's that's what makes entrepreneurship work, right? Like mm -hmm. these these people yeah. that are so optimistic, that have these dreams and can do all of this. And then, you know, then all of a sudden I'm like, oh man, what a downer. He's telling me, you know, <laughs> probability is I'm going to fail, which is true. I mean, this isn't a stat you're making up. This is this is a stat you can look at, you know, with the small business association, with whatever, that these businesses fail. But what I what I really like about what you're talking about here is understanding why the business you want, other businesses like you failed so that you can be prepared for that or at least have some kind of plan for to take care of that. Um, yes. The other thing Absolutely. is, I kind of want to talk about this uh, survivorship bias because yes. I, th I think you're right where it's, you know, you only hear the story of those people that that succeeded. But then on the other hand, I mean, almost every entrepreneur story that, you know, whether I've talked to them or read a book or watched a movie or whatever, like the turning point for them is this like rock bottom, almost failing type of thing. And so on one hand, I understand that we only hear about people that succeed, but but then on the other, I mean, almost every success story that I hear starts with, I was overly optimistic. I hit rock bottom and that became sort of my turning point or rock moving forward. So if I'm thinking of starting something or I'm not getting the results that I want, you know, do I have to hit rock bottom? And, uh, more importantly, like how do I balance that if I'm, if I'm thinking of starting a business? Great question. So that's what, a, a number of people who I consult with and coach with ask me those sorts of questions. And I tell them that, uh, you know, yes, the sto success stories you've heard do have people hitting rock bottom and then bouncing up. But again, you don't hear the failure stories of the people <laughs> who hit rock bottom and then right. bottom out. You know, they fell through the bottom of the well. They didn't, they didn't climb back out of the bottom of the well. And like you said yourself, the stats show that the large majority of people go and they don't get back from the bottom. Right. All those businesses, all those business people, uh, those entrepreneurs had the hope that they would succeed. That's why they launched their business. So their story isn't a baseline different. There is a lot of luck involved in success, and there's a lot of planning involved in success. So the only thing that an entrepreneur can do is learn to plan, figure out why she or he would fail. So no, that's not the only thing, but that's one of the things right. that they need to do. Figure out why or he or she may fail. So this pre-mortem strategy is something I always take my clients through. Go through every aspect of why you might fail and address those. You know, something that uh, research shows successful businesses do, successful entrepreneurs do, is have enough cash on hand for two disasters. Two disasters at the same time, because one disaster will definitely happen. I mean, that always happens. Now, the ones who survived, now what's the likelihood of two disasters happening at the same time? The longer your business goes, the more likely it is to happen. So a successful business, one that lasts a long time, 
has enough resources on hand to survive two disasters. And that's one of the basic pre-mortem strategies, kind of surviving two disasters. Then look at all the things that might fail. For example, as your business grows, do you have enough organizational capacity, organizational infrastructure to address improving business? A number of businesses fail at that stage. They don't have enough uh, organizational infrastructure and they don't learn enough to ramp up quickly. So when they have more demand, Again, there are so many ways people can fail. It's very important to look at each failure point and address it in advance. Yeah. And so that's what, yes. And I don't want to spend like everything on this, like you're going to fail, make a list of how you're going to sure. fail. But I do think that this is important. And yeah. And and what what I find really interesting is that you said, you know, make this list of all the ways, all the things basically that could go wrong, which I think is a good strategy so long as you don't get stuck there forever. Yes. Um, but but then what you said is you have to trust those. And I mm-hmm. think that this, again, comes into this sort of push and pull between emotional decision-making and science-based decision-making because it's one thing for me to listen to you and say the stats are this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to sit down and write down all the reasons I'm going to fail. What I tend to do personally, and, and I made this mistake in my own business, was I look at those things and go, yeah, but that's not going to happen to me. Like my emotions <laughs> take over, right? Like my yeah. emotions take over and go, yeah, but you're back to, you're the snowflake. You're different. You're all of these things. So mm-hmm. how can somebody, you know, get this list down, look at it, tr- like you said, trust that those things are at least accept that those things are a reality and, and can mm-hmm. happen. And then what do you, how do you use that? to go to the next level. Excellent. Yeah, so the people who I consult with who were successful in going to the next level, they did, so I, one of the things I coach people in and consult people in is emotional and social intelligence. So after looking at this list, what they need to do is not flinch away and not put it in their you know desk bottom <laughs> desk floor. <laughs> what they need to do is have an accepting attitude. Look within themselves, look within their emotions and say, okay, these are the statistics. I have, you know, if I enter the restaurant business, I have a 10% chance of success on baseline, assuming I'm not, you know, nobody is a special snowflake or everybody is. So I have a 10% chance of success. And you know what? And that's okay. That's okay. I have to just accept that there's a 90% likelihood that I will fail. I have a 10% chance of success. But this business, This dream is worth it. It's worth that risk. It's worth that risk plans. So the people who I work with who succeed and what the research shows that people who succeed are the ones who accept the risk, the ones who don't flinch away from it emotionally. They are emotionally intelligent about themselves. They accept the probabilities and they still go forward. They're not overconfident. They're realistically confident in the sense that they are confident in themselves and their skills, and they are confident that they can recover if they fail. Because, you know, most entrepreneurs, I'm sure some of the listeners of your show, it's not their first business. Right. They're not their first business. Their first business venture will not necessarily succeed. But their second might, or their third might, or their tenth might, or their twentieth might, you know, depending on the person. So having a t- determination to take an approach of learning from what you do, having um, so there's a really good, great book called The Lean Startup, which I recommend to my clients, which talks about learning by experimentation. So figuring out what works, what doesn't, doing more of what works, doing less of what doesn't work, and not seeing things that don't work as a failure, but as an opportunity to learn, and even seeing your whole business venture as an opportunity to learn. Even if it fails, even if you bottom out, that's fine. That's okay. As long as you can accept that and live with that, you can actually engage with the list of things that goes wrong, that would go wrong, and keep revising it over time, which is another strategy I talk to my clients about. How do you address this list over time? Because a business at zero months is different than a business at two years, is different than a business at five years. And each of these has a different way that it can go wrong. And you need to be okay emotionally with all of that. And I, I love how 
you know, as you're explaining this, how, you know, basically the emotional and scientific decision making sort of meshed together in a way. I mean, the visual mm-hmm. I get as you're as you're describing this is like, I d I don't know, like uh somebody standing there basically looking in the mirror facing their fear. And I mean that's really what it is, yes. right? Like it's like, yes. are you it you can't hide from it. Like you can't pull it over. Mm-hmm. You can't make your list, hide under the covers and hope that that's not true because well then you <laughs> then you fail, right? Like yes. and, and if you ignore it without knowing it's there, having that healthy respect for what could go wrong, you'll, you'll never deal with it. So I love, I sort of love that, that visual, uh, that you make as you talk about this. And then when you went and talked about the lean startup and you said, you know, like do more of what works, less of what doesn't, but test and try everything. And one of the big mistakes that I feel like I see entrepreneurs making all of the time is they fail at something. And like I said, I don't like to use the word fail, but something doesn't go the way as they expect, right? With their optimism mm-hmm. or and, and anything else, it doesn't go the way they expect. And they go, that doesn't work. I'm, I'm off to something else. This is all hogwash yeah. or, or they give up, right? Like they get this yeah. defeatist victim mentality. And what I love about, you know, the lean startup and, and how you're explaining this is no, that's not a failure. That that's growth. Like that's how you mm-hmm. um, go to the next level. And I, and, and it's almost looping back to, you know, where we start with the survivorship basis, where every story you hear most most success stories they hit rock bottom and they move on mm-hmm. and i think that this survivorship bias that that comes out in in people starting is they don't hear that part and they expect that that for them it's just going to be smooth sailing because yeah. because you know i'm not going to make a mistake or i know what my uh failure points could be so i won't do that and then all of a sudden when something doesn't go the way uh that they anticipated I mean, the, the wheels fall off the wagon and they don't, they don't know how to move. They get stuck. I think you're absolutely right, Lance. And that's a really wise point that you make, that they don't expect failure or they don't expect that things will not necessarily go as they would like them to go. And they are unable to recover. And the main thing that causes them to be unable to recover is emotions. They feel bad. So that's where the emotional and social intelligence comes in. People feel bad about it, and they, and like you said, they throw up their hands. And I had a lot of my clients who came to me and said, like, oh, this thing is not working. Why is it not working? You know, it's not going according to plan. And I'm like, okay, you know, you're doing a new thing. It's okay. It's not necessarily going to go according to plan. Take from this, what, you, what did you learn? And then I go with my client, and I sit through and list out the things that they learned from going through yeah. this experience and how they can do things better in the future within this area, or they can pivot to another area if they decide based on significant evidence that really th- their activity is important. But yes, I think one of the big failure modes that I notice is people not being sufficiently persistent, that's one, and also taking too big of a risk with a venture so you know if we go back to the food startup to the food thing there's a way to test out the waters you can get a food truck before launching a big fancy restaurant right or you can be do some if you're a software uh, person you know i consult with those you can start doing things on the side while still keeping your corporate b job and see if there's a market for your services as opposed to you know, punching your boss in the face and leaving and saying, okay, now I'll be independent and do things on my own. Because, yeah, I mean, that's not a recipe for success. And and there was something that you said very subtle that I think is a super important exercise. And that is when things don't go the way you expect them, sit down and list it out so that you know what they are and figure out what the learning experience was from that. And I think that so many times that's the disconnect. I mean, that's the bridge from a bump in the road to getting over the bump, right? Like, I mean, a, a lot of people, and, and, and I think that there's something, um, to actually sitting down and writing it out. Um, cause you know, a lot of people go, yeah, I did it in my head. I learned blah, blah, blah. But I, I and I don't, I can't prove this. Maybe, you know, something about this, but like mm-hmm. something happens when you actually, and you've said this a number of times, like sit down and list this out, list this out, get a li-. There's something that happens when you do the physical, uh, action of actually like making a list or writing something out where it comes out of your head, sort of into the physical world, one that you can 
see it in a different light, you know, see maybe what you did learn from it, but also you can like get rid of it and get it out of your system so that you don't have to dwell there. And I think that one thing that you said really subtly can help so many people just overcome these little hurdles that they get through. Cause I really believe that's the bridge. Lance, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, this is why I create a lot of tip sheets and guideline sheets for my clients to guide them through these activities. Now, the reason I do this is because there has been significant research showing the benefits of externalizing it and not simply, so there's, when we have it in our heads, it's very vague and fuzzy. Yeah. And we think, okay, we learned, but really research shows that we don't keep things in our memory nearly as well if we don't externalize them. And externalizing them means talking them out to a friend, to your colleague, to me, so a consultant coach or somebody else, and getting feedback from them. And doing the exercise, sitting down by yourself and doing the exercise. So research shows that writing things out causes us to reflect on these things in a much more thorough and cons conscious manner, applying our reason to it as opposed to just our emotions and intuitions. And we can figure out much more effectively where things have gone wrong. Moreover, if you write things out, then you have a track record and you can go back to the past. So it's essentially being a scientist in regard to your business. Looking at the evidence, creating an experiment, you have a hypothesis. This product will do thing X, you know, and then you have a high, and then you experiment. Will uh, will a hundred people buy uh, this, you know, cheesesteak if I make it? And then you see if that happens for five dollars and then you see if that happens and then you gather the evidence and you backtrack it and then okay you know maybe i change some ingredients and then more people will buy it or maybe the marketing or something like that so that allows you to be very experimental and very scientific in regard to your business and that there's a high correlation between that approach and business success so people who do that are much more successful much more likely to be successful than people who don't do that now Talking to showing others what you wrote out, your business partner, again, you know, your husband or wife or friend or someone gets you an external perspective. And that really is very helpful for cooling down the optimism of many entrepreneurs because, you know, oh, hey, my business, it's my baby. You know, it, it can't criticize it. Uh, it's awesome and so on and so on. But really, no, it's not nearly as awesome as we tend to think it is. And, and, and that's you know, why this, the outside perspective is so helpful. You know, and what, what's interesting about all of this is when, when we first started talking about this, you know, I thought you were going to be like, you no, know, you got to make all your decisions based on numbers and science and all of this stuff. And, and really, um, what you're talking about is mixing the emotional with the scientific, not getting rid of it. Mm -hmm. and, and what I keep hearing is your brain plays tricks on you. Your brain yes. plays tricks on you. And until you get that under control by externalizing things, by understanding there's a survivorship bias, uh, by doing this pre-mortem, listing out all of this stuff and getting out there, like you really do get tricked in this weird part where you need to have this balance of emotional and science-based decision-making. But if you're not aware and doing the things that you're talking about, you end up in almost 100% emotional Based, meaning whatever tricks your mind is playing on you and you're not looking at the facts and reality and more important you're not moving forward based on the experiences that you have so i actually i mean i love this stuff i think that you've given a ton of not only like good theoretical stuff but like real things that all of us can do and incorporate into our businesses you know starting right now and if somebody's listening to this gleb and they want to find out more about you i know that you've written a bunch of books i know that you do consulting um where can they go to get in touch with you, see what you're up to, find out more about this science-based decision-making process for their business. Sure. Uh, so they can check out my website, which is glebtsipursky.com, G-L-E-B-T-S-I-P-U-R-S-K-Y.com. I also run a nonprofit called Intentional Insights, and the website there is intentionalinsights.org. If they want to contact me by email, it's gleb at intentionalinsights.org or just Google my name, that'll come up, Gleb Tsipursky. So I welcome all queries and I'll be happy to chat with any of your listeners.
Awesome. Well, I appreciate you being here. I think this is fascinating and something that, you know, everybody should incorporate these ideas into their daily process, into how they're looking at their business. You can check out Gleb at glebsapersky.com or intentionalinsights.org. You can email him at gleb at intentionalinsights.org. And as always, we'll have all of those links for you inside of the show notes. We appreciate you taking the time to be here, Gleb, and everybody else. Thank you for listening. We'll talk to you on the next episode. Bye now. Do you run your online business using WordPress? Did you know that the number one reason why people's WordPress sites get hacked is because of outdated plugins, outdated WordPress, or just flat out not knowing what they have out there? I mean, how many times have you created a test site and just let it sit there? You're leaving yourself at risk. Besides that, you're wasting a ton of time every single time WordPress updates or your plugins update. There's a better way. Check out Website Remote, where you can manage all of your WordPress sites from one simple-to-use dashboard. I'm talking about comparing what's on each site, comparing what versions are out there, and most importantly, choosing what you want to update when you want to update it with one single click. This is the way that you need to be managing all of your WordPress sites. And we have a special just for you for being a listener of The Lance Tomashiro Show. Head on over to WebsiteRemote.com forward slash LTS. That's WebsiteRemote.com forward slash LTS to get your 99 cent trial started today. You're never going to look at managing your WordPress sites the same way again.